you know, this is supposed to be that moment where like the movie ends and like your arms are raised in triumph, right? And you shoot the credits, but y'all, that's not how real life is. You know what happened? What I was realizing was that the very goal that I set out was not enough for me. No matter where we are in our walks of life, we all struggle with purpose and identity. Join us on the search for something better, real hope, peace, and meaning. Welcome to the Something Better podcast with your hosts, Michelle and April. Hey, everyone. Welcome to today's episode. Hey, if you're new here, we just want to take a minute to say welcome. And if you're already part of our online community, then welcome back. We're so glad that you're joining us today. Well, in today's episode, we chat with guest Jacob Browning. Jacob gets personal with us as he shares his story and touches on several different areas. He opens up about his experience as a young child with physical abuse from his own father. He shares about his love for baseball and the performance-based mentality that he had, and sometimes it got in the way. He also opens up about a life-threatening injury that really changes the trajectory of his life. Jacob's story is powerful, and we just know you're going to be so encouraged today. So sit back and listen. Here is our conversation with Jacob. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Something Better podcast. We are so excited that you joined us today for another episode. And in this episode, we have an incredible story from our guest, Jacob Browning. And we'll begin diving at, into that in a minute. But first, welcome to the show, Jacob. We're so glad to have you here. What's up? Something better. Thanks a lot for having me. Awesome. Well, I know our listeners are excited to get to know you. So why don't you start us off briefly just introducing yourself and sharing a little more about who you are and what you do? Sure. Yeah. So uh, state in the obvious, Jacob Browning. I'm from South Georgia. The greatest accomplishment in my life is being a husband to Alicia Browning. Used to be Alicia Goodwin. We have uh, one little boy. We just celebrated a couple of days ago his first birthday. So that was really surreal. I find myself being the old guy now that says, man, it just flies right by, you know, the stuff that people, <laughs> people say. So yeah, I'm definitely dad status now. And that's what fills up most of my time. And that's where I find a lot of joy in my life. Awesome. Well, we are excited to dive into your story like I like I shared a minute ago. So why don't we start off with a bit of your background? And could you kind of walk us through uh, what was your life like growing up and maybe some of the significant moments that really helped to shape your identity? Sure. Uh, It's a great question. And when I'm thinking about my background, I really can't talk about the man that I was, the man that I even am now without talking about my father. I grew up in an environment where I grew up in a, uh, in a situation where uh, physical abuse was pretty regular throughout my life. I have a little sister and she's three years younger than me. And so my father was, uh, he was physically abusive to us. And what that really did was it really gave me a lot of false ideas. It planted a lot of false seeds, if you will, in my head about what a man should be and could be and couldn't be. And uh, it really distorted the way that I looked at not just male relationships, really all relationships. And I found myself as I got a little bit older, like middle school and high school, definitely in the college too, where I found myself wanting to prove that I'm not going to be him, my, my dad. And so the things that he was, I didn't want to be that. And the things that he wasn't, I wanted to be, right? So I found myself really building this caricature of what a man should be. And unfortunately, because of the false model that was before me, I really didn't know where to start. So I felt very lost. Thanks for sharing. Can you talk to us a little bit about... How did that impact you, you know, as an adolescent and going into high school? You know, it really stems from the very first time I think that my dad was physically abusive to me. And, you know, just kind of quickly, I'll give you the lowdown on that because it really started, it really impacted me for the majority of my young adulthood and adolescence and everything else. So I was probably like 
third or fourth grade. And my mom used to give me and my sister a little bit of money for lunch. And she would like give us like a, a dollar for an ice cream, like a dollar for, you know, a soda. And uh, being an immature kid, I was playing with my money on the bus. And this older kid came by and like just swiped it out of my hands. And, you know, didn't stop or anything like that. I just walked by, saw the money, grabbed it out of my hands, and kept walking to the back of the bus. And I was like, whoa, what just happened, right? And I got home that night and I told my mom about it. And, uh, well, I, what I actually said was, mom, can I have two more dollars? Uh, <laughs> tomorrow can I have four dollars? And anyways, she told me no. And my dad found out. And my dad uh, came into my room and he said, he said, son, men do not let people take advantage of them. They stick up for themselves. And tomorrow I better get a call from the school. And if I don't, you're going to wish I did get a call from the school. If this guy tries to take your money again, I expect you to punch him. You know, I'm like third or fourth grade. Like I'm like as, if a third or fourth grader can experience hopelessness, like I was in it because like it's a lose lose. Like like I'm going to get beat up by this older kid or whatever, whatever it else means from dad is what's going to happen. Right. And, of course, the next day I was like paralyzed by fear and didn't do anything. And wouldn't you know it, the kid did take my money again. And when I got home from school, my, my dad was waiting at the door and he said, I never got a phone call. And uh, he said, what did I tell you? And, you know, I just started crying. And that was the first time that my dad was physically abusive to me. And he said the next day I'd better get a call. And of course, uh, what did I do? I was so afraid of what was going to happen again from dad that I don't even think the kid saw me coming this time. Right. He was on the bus and he was walking through and I just stood up and punched him. And uh, he was a bigger kid and I said in a movie, right. It's real life. Um, so a uh, dad got me. And then the next day the kid got me. But here's where things get really interesting is when we get back to the school, the school bus driver takes us to the office and my dad receiving the call he was waiting on. He came through the doors of the principal's office and he didn't stop to look at the secretary. He didn't say, my name is so-and-so. He didn't talk to the principal. He didn't look at the assistant principal. He walked straight over to me and he picked me up and he put my head on his chest and he patted my back and he whispered in my ear and he said, son, I'm so proud of you. Now to a third or fourth grader, right? affirmation from role model from dad whatever right or it means the world to you and like he took me to get a blizzard that day from dairy queen shout out to dairy queen right what that told me though was that that's how you handle problems in your life like i was getting that affirmation from dad and what that essentially started building in my head was this person that was a-okay with aggression and violence and y'all hey let me i'm no jet lee all right. Like I've never trained MMA or anything like that. Like I'm not trying to tell you that I'm some sort of like hardcore brawler guy, but like this part of manhood that was being built in my head, deeply informed my relationship going forward. And were you aware, like as a child, you know, looking back at it now, you can recognize it as abuse. But were you aware in your childhood that your family was a little different than others or that something was wrong or not really? That's a great question. Um, don't give me more credit than I deserve. Cause I mean, keep in mind, I'm, I mean, how old are you in third or fourth grade? Like nine or 10, 11, something like that. Right. So I uh, know, I mean, I'm still building the world around me. And so I assume that everybody's experience was like that. I remember this one time I was over at my friend's house and they lived just down the road. It was right about the same time, you know, not quite middle school, basically. Right. Really wherever you start to like branch out and you're looking at things outside of your household, kind of like, you know, getting cues from the world. I was at my friend's house and my friend's dad said, hey, guys, we were playing a uh, wiffle ball, which is like baseball, but like a little plastic ball, plastic bat. We were just out there being kids. And uh, his dad said, guys, do not go into the neighbor's yard. He does not like you guys jumping the fence. You guys might mess the fence up. If the ball goes over the fence, call me and I'll go get it. So when you know it, of course, the ball goes over the fence. But what did we not do? We didn't go ask him to go get it. Instead, I jumped the fence and went to the neighbor's yard where I wasn't supposed to be to grab the ball. But about that time, my friend's dad came out the door and he hollered, hey, pause for a second. At my house, if you get caught doing something bad, it's not going to be good. So you know what I did? I ran all the way home, which was about half a mile. I didn't, I didn't even respond. I just ran to my house. And the next day, my friends were like, dude, what's your deal? And of course, I was 10 or 11 or whatever. I didn't have a great answer, but I remember... That being one of the earliest instances and in realizing that, wait a minute, this isn't how it is everywhere. 
Yeah, so it's kind of a moment, an awakening moment. Okay, you are into sports, and I know you played baseball. So tell us how that kind of entered uh, the picture. Yeah, so as I get into middle school and high school, my relationship with my dad gets more and more strained, right? And I started kind of building this idea in my head that I'm going to be everything that he's not, kind of like what I was saying earlier. So my dad, uh, he never had a job, so I don't know what it's like for him to wake up and put on a tie, go to work, or wait for him to get home from work. He was always at the house. My mom had a job. He wasn't very good at school. Um, he didn't play sports. So I ran towards sports. I wanted to do good in school. I wanted to position myself to have a good job one day. I, you know, I wanted all this stuff, right? And what I noticed was that sports was natural for me because I found sports to be gratifying in that here's a product you give. And if the product's good, you get immediate affirmation from it. And affirmation was big for me. Like I wanted people's approval and sports because I, you know, in some ways I was naturally good at it. It was a place for a coach, a teammate to come up and high five me. And I just got elated by that experience, you know, so like kind of earning that favor that I wanted from other people. So that was sort of the natural gravitation towards sports. But baseball was uh, okay, I can romanticize baseball. I think it's poetry in motion. I love baseball, right? <laughs> There's something really special about baseball in this regard. It is truly, truly a game of failure. I mean, think, take, for example, a great hitter, a hitter that goes to the Hall of Fame, he gets on base three times out of 10, 30%, right? So I guess that I related to the struggle and the failures in baseball personally. You know, like it was just, it was a sport that just seemed to be temperamentally, if a sport can have a temperament, just perfect for who I was as a person. So how did that kind of feed into how you were feeling about what your identity was or, or your purpose when you think about not just the whole idea of sports, but baseball itself? What I would say is that sports definitely led the way in this, but my whole mantra in my head was this deep, deep desire to earn things, right? To earn favor, to earn praise, to prove to the world that I won't be like my dad, that I want to be something different, right? So there's this sort of just like, I want to show and to make sure that everybody knows that what I have and who I am is because I've worked hard, right? Like this striving, this endless, insatiable, um, never satisfied, what's next? I'm going to show you how I can do this. And that played out with grades. It was with girls or, I mean, it was with everything. Everything to me was a competition and it was something I needed to win and prove that I could do. So my identity was, what can I accomplish next? So what happened after that? I know there was a life-changing experience for you where you couldn't do that anymore. Fast forward to college and I make a college baseball team and dad never went to college, you know, so like, you know, keep in mind, as I'm going through the story. Like you can pretty much say it relates back to him in some way. Right. But I'm at college and not to be too stereotypical, but, you know, the aggression and things like that, you know, I really saw life as something I wanted to escape from. I escaped through sports. I experimented very early in high school with beer and liquor and weed, right? So like when I got to college, it was that, but now it's like, it's, I got more access to it, you know? So, I mean, I was, I was an every weekend partier. I mean, I couldn't wait for Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and for the recovery on Sunday. And so get to college and I'm on a baseball team and we were out partying one night. And uh, there was this guy that was with us that we were leaving the bars and I look back and uh, he's getting jumped. And again, y'all, not because I'm you know, Jackie Chan and Rush Hour, or because I'm, I don't know, some other really hardcore dude. Like I was just comfortable with aggression and with violence. And like, it was just like a part of my life. And rather than looking back and going, let's get out of here, I ran towards it. And I remember coming in and I punched a guy and I go to grab the guy that was getting jumped. And as I'm turning, I get hit with a bottle, a wine bottle. And it knocked me to the ground and all of the attention kind of got focused on me. And they didn't stop kicking until I was going into convulsions. So they split. And by the time the damage was done, so this whole side of my head, you know, this skull has been completely rebuilt. Um, there's a titanium plate in there now. They broke my orbital bone. They broke my cheekbone. And the small bone that protects your hearing canal, that penetrated my eardrum. And I'm not 100% deaf in my ear, but I'm still uh, legally deaf in my left ear. And I was, I was messed up. Like it, was, it was bad. So what winds up happening next is I wake up in the hospital and 
the first thing I notice is that, well, I'm in a hospital and I'm chained to the hospital bed. My arms and legs are chained literally to the hospital bed because I'd experienced some brain damage. And, you know, you have some like involuntary twitches and things like that, and it can be dangerous. So they chain you. But the second thing I noticed is that my mom is at my bedside. She's to my left. And she is, as any mother would be, she was distraught. And when I went to comfort her by saying, Mom, I'm okay, when I opened my mouth, words didn't come out, just noises. I would actually describe this as the scariest moment in my entire life. Now, coming from the abuse and some sketchy situations in high school, the stuff that I was messing around with and stuff like that, this is by far the scariest moment of my life. Because how hopeless is it to try to comfort your mourning mother and you can't say the words? It's like this. You know what I thought in an instant, actually? I knew that I was thinking coherently. Like I knew that my thoughts were in a progression, but no words were coming out of my mouth. And I thought like, this is, this is what it feels like to be crazy because crazy people don't know they're crazy. Like in an instant, like that's what I was thinking. And I started like just kind of going crazy in my bed and I'm chained there still. So like, and my mom doesn't know what's going on. I'm just making these noises. They don't know if I'm in pain or whatever. So the nurses rush in and they sedate me again. Yeah, I mean, it was the it was the scariest moment of my life. So as you're going through these traumatic moments, I guess we should say after this, are you then contemplating like, what's the purpose of all this? What what does this mean? Why am I having to go through this? Like, what kind of thoughts are going through your head? I would say that a wise person would ask that. But y'all, I was so self-absorbed. I was so me-centric. I was so, watch how I can do this. You know what happened? They had given me a dry erase board and had made sure that I was calm and they unchained me and they said, and that was how I was going to communicate with them by writing on that erase board. The first thing I wrote was, am I going to play baseball again? Because at this point now I realized whatever has happened, this is serious. And I turned around and showed it to him and you could tell that he was heavy, but he said, um, he said, I'm sorry, but that's going to be out of the question. And here's what I wrote. I wrote essentially this. There were some colorful language, but I essentially wrote this. You're wrong. You don't know me was what I wrote. But y'all in America, we like to like, we love the rugged individualist type caricature, right? Please don't give that praise because y'all, I was so lost in who I was and what I could do, right? That the ultimate questions we should be asking about purpose and about identity and design were not on my mind. It was all about, oh, yeah, watch what Jacob's all about. Watch what Jacob can do. I got to tell you, like, I look back at the, that me and I think that's repulsive, like to be sitting in a bed. I know that, like, we like to romanticize that sort of like down but never out. But, y'all, there are times in life where that can really become your identity and that sort of striving, that endless striving is not good for your mental, emotional well-being, that there's got to be something more to this because here's what winds up happening. I do go on and after one year of rehab and things like that, I do get back on a baseball team, a college baseball team. So I relearn how to walk, relearn how to talk, all, the whole deal, right? Went through all of it. And the first day that, all right, so I make a team and then I find myself in the starting lineup. And, you know, this is supposed to be that moment where like the movie ends and like your arms are raised in triumph, right? And you shoot the credits, but y'all, that's not how real life is. You know what happened? I hope, I hope that this proves my point. I saw my name written in on the starting lineup and that should have been a moment where I break down. I mean, imagine that the journey back, right? That should be the culmination of everything. But you know what happened? I immediately thought I better play good. This is fleeting if I don't play good. So you know what happened? I struck out three times that game, and I think I hit a ground ball. And you know what happened after the game? Rather than going and calling my mom and telling her about this ma amazing accomplishment, I stayed late at the field, and I sat in the dugout, and I cried because what I was realizing was that the very goal that I set out was not enough for me, that there's something in me that strives and longs for something more than just the goals that I set out for myself. So obviously you've processed – Traumatic moments, lots of emotions. It sounds like it's kind of hitting you here in the dugout somewhat. So would you say like the accident, the baseball, the abuse, you know, then the two-year recovery, was this kind of a turning point in the trajectory of your life or how did that play out? 
that would be a great char uh, character art for a movie. However, you have no idea how stubborn I am. You know what happened? Rather than that being a wake up moment, like what you're saying, April, actually, I started medicating myself with, with weed and with alcohol and with girls and with accomplishments in the classroom and working harder at baseball to keep that starting job. And unfortunately, uh, it led to just more emptiness because I was treating life as though it was something I needed to escape from. I needed the girls. I needed the beer. I needed the weed. I needed the accomplishments to escape the realness of who I was as a person. I needed the accomplishments to distract me from who I really am. I, I mean, I will, I can certainly get us to that sort of turning point. It was actually after I had graduated my undergraduate degree and I was actually uh, in, in graduate school and I was interested in this girl and I found myself in a church, not because I wanted to be there, not because I was looking for God, because of that girl, right? And there was this pastor that was in the pulpit, country guy, you know, big dude. He's like 6'4", hairy knuckled top dude. I mean, man's man, you know, and he was up there in the pulpit and he had his Bible and he was just, just rooting, tooting, shooting the gospel. And uh, he did something that I don't think that Christian had ever done before to me. Well, I felt like it was to me. I was in the congregation. It was maybe 40 people in this church, but like I felt like he was in my grill, right? At the end of the sermon, he says, if you think you can punch a hole in Christianity, you give me a call. And at this point in my life, if you're in my face, I've made it a habit to get you out of my face. So I took down his number. And I would say that that was probably a turning point in my life. Well, it's amazing how God uses these things you would never think about right? That fit perfectly with your personality and character to challenge you and at the same time lead you over <laughs> so you could, so you could start that. What, what happened from there? How did that, uh, cause that's a long, as you said, that was a long journey and it wasn't a, a movie ending. How did uh, you about, uh, get to the, the next, the next level, I guess, in your journey? Yeah, it was about five, almost right at five years. So what happens next is um, my undergraduate's degree and my training, my formal education is in history, and I studied historiography. And, uh, you know, this guy's up there with the Bible, this archaic book that's wrong about morals, that, you know, doesn't understand humanity. And, you know, it's just this dated, old, religious, just irrelevant book, right? And he's just like making all these claims from it. And, what you do in historiography, basically, is you take a really hard look at the way things are recorded and you try to figure out if that is actually what happened, right? That's historiography. And so what did I do? Well, I went home and uh, in my apartment with my roommates and everything, well, there was a Bible there. I don't know whose it was. It wasn't mine, um, but there was a Bible there. And I treated the Bible just like any other book I'd ever read. I opened it up to the table of contents. And there were two semesters that I did special topics, history. Both of them was on ancient Rome. So when I see in the table of contents uh, in the Bible, I see the book of Romans. I'm like, that's my ticket, right? And so I flip over. And y'all, just to let you know, this is on Thirsty Thursday, half price drinks, for those of you who don't know. We used to always pregame in our apartment. And uh, what that means is like I, we would grill and start partying at our place before we went to the bars, basically. So we did that at our place all the time. So I'm in the kitchen and I'm putting meat on marinade to grill, right? Middle of the afternoon, couldn't be more inglorious, right? And I open this Bible up and I flip over to Romans because I think this is my ticket to prove this country bumpkin pastor wrong. And Paul gets through the introduction there and, and then he shifts and he says something to me that no Christian has ever said to me before in my whole life. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the gospel that saves people by faith. Oh, really? Typically, if someone wanted to go there with me before, I would bring up, as a matter of fact, oh, yeah, you're loving God? That's interesting. Let me tell you about what my dad used to do to me and my sister. Where was your loving God then? But notice what Paul says there. Paul says that I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Paul was getting in my face. And then he says right after that, he says, for the wrath, that's an important word, the wrath of God is being revealed against us all the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, me, who by their unrighteousness, which is basically wickedness, right? Who by their wickedness suppress the truth. Imagine push down, right? Doesn't disprove truth. You force it down. 
Paul continues and says that we're delivered over to a debased mind and thinking that we're wise. That was me. Thinking that we're wise, we become fools and we worship ourselves and idols and the creepy and crawly things of the earth. Talk about pulling out my heart. It was as though God ripped into my chest, yanked my heart out, and showed it to me and let me read it. And you know, y'all, this was heavy for me. In fact, I found myself not seeing a vision or anything weird like that. I didn't hear any voices, okay? It was nothing like that. But I'd be lying to you if I told you that I was standing up by this point. Y'all was sitting in the floor of our kitchen crying. And here's why I was emotional. I had seen wrath from my dad. I knew what wrath was. You didn't have to tell me about it. I tasted it, felt it, experienced it. I knew what wrath was. But this was the first time in my life that I was knew that there was wrath coming, but I still had this weird sense that everything was going to be okay. So that in talking about that, you you talked about the gospel a couple of times. And, and for people that don't know, that just means good news. So this was good news for you, right? The good news was coming. Yeah, because uh, what was going to happen was later that day. So Michelle, April, a few girls would have knocked on the door and come in right in that moment. And it was like, Jacob, what's, what's your deal? I would have with all of my heart meant this. I would look at you and said, I have no idea. I don't know. I don't know what's going on. What winds up happening is that later that day, I uh, lied to my buddies and told them I wasn't feeling well. We still had the party, of course, but I lied to them and said, I'm not feeling well. I'm staying in tonight. And I gave away all my beer, gave away my weed. And I stayed in that night and I read the rest of Romans. And that good news that you're just referencing, the good news is that though wrath is certainly on the horizon, that God is justified, meaning that he is with good reason upset and angry that there is a way out of that wrath and if you continue reading in romans and i'm more than happy to talk about that journey but yeah that good news that that was coming changed my life forever well you, you talk about the good news but that didn't necessarily answer all your questions right <laughs> and we can tell our, our listeners that that's your story doesn't stop with just realizing that you've got that good news I know oh, no. you're wrestling with some big questions, such as why does a good God even allow this kind of thing to happen to people, this evil? Um, how do you reconcile being so angry and also wanting justice? Uh, and so actually, we are going in part two of your story, Jacob's story. Jacob is going to walk us through how he started processing and discovering answers to those questions and more. And I have a feeling a lot of you can relate to that. So tune in to our next episode and you can hear the rest of Jacob's journey. Jacob, if you don't mind now, before we close, maybe you can share a Bible verse or a, a passage that's been really significant for your life. I'll share one from later in the book, uh, Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there be no condemnation. There be no guilt. There be no guilt. There be no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now that I have to say is good news. Amen. Jacob's story will continue into episode 11. Be sure to check it out and remember, review, rate, and subscribe, and we will see you next time. Jesus truly is something better, the answer to our search for meaning and identity. He can bring real purpose and joy to your life. We'd love to help you get to know him. So connect with us online at somethingbetter.us backslash podcast. And if you're ready to begin a relationship with him today, just click the learn more button. On our site, you'll also find previous episodes and you can share your feedback with us in a voice message. We release a new episode every two weeks, so be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Did you enjoy today's episode? Take a screenshot of the episode on your phone and tag us on Instagram at find something better. We'd love your help in sharing this great content with others. 